Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining Risky Business, the need for 3D seismic imaging at the Wabash Valley Resources CCS project. My name is Kelly, and I'm with your Citizens Action Coalition, and we are so glad that you all joined us tonight. A um, couple of quick housekeeping items before we dive in with the webinar. Uh, first of all, as you can see, we are recording this webinar. We will be sharing a recording of the webinar and presentation slides after the fact. So there is no need to furiously take notes throughout the webinar this evening. Um, second thing to keep in mind is that we are going to wrap up the webinar with a question and answer session. We're going to be using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So as questions pop up to you this evening, as folks are presenting, please use that question in a Q&A box to type your questions in. But do be patient with us because we're going to wait to get to them until the end of the webinar. And if we run out of time tonight, know that we will be following up via email with answers to your questions. Uh, real quick, and then I'll kick it off to Kerwin, but so that you get to know our presenters tonight, we do have Kerwin Olson, the Executive Director here at Citizens Action Coalition. He's going to be providing some really important background information for us tonight. And then we are absolutely thrilled to have Dan Gish and Steve Bulgin with 3D Seismic Solutions. They are going to teach us a lot tonight, folks, but they will walk us through some of the significant risks associated with sequestering millions of tons of carbon dioxide waste in Vico and Vermilion counties. Uh, so thanks again for joining. Type your questions in the Q&A box. Kerwin, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Kelly, for the intro, and thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. As Kelly said, I am uh, Kerwin Olson, the Executive Director uh, here at CAC, here to give some, oh, pretty quick and brief, brief uh, background before turning it over to our experts, Dan and Steve, to uh, educate us. They've got a lot to cover, so I will I will try to be, uh, try to be quick. Uh, but just to lay the foundation, a little background, make sure everybody knows what we're talking about here. I thought we'd start with, you know, what exactly is carbon capture and storage, otherwise known as uh, CCS. There's three steps to CCS, effectively. Uh, the first step is capturing the CO2 or separating the CO2 from other gases that are produced during uh, industrial processes, coal plants, gas plants, uh, refineries, ethanol plants, cement plants, et cetera. Separating that blue gas, you can do that either pre-combustion or post-combustion. That flue gas, that CO2 is then uh, compressed into a supercritical state uh, and highly pressurized, approximately 2100 PSI. And then it has to be transported to where it is going to be stored or sequestered. That is generally done by in, uh, putting the highly pressurized supercritical CO2 into a pipeline, transporting that pipeline, uh, transporting that CO2 via that pipeline to the, to the, to the dump site. Um, where uh, allegedly it will be stored uh, in perpetuity or potentially reused uh, for other use. And then the third step uh, is, of course, the storage, where the CO2 is uh, sequestered or stored underground in deep geological formations, saline aquifers, other formations, uh, usually at least a half mile, if not deeper, uh, below ground. And what are the risks? Uh, you know, there's many risks of CCS, but I'm gonna highlight uh, what we're talking about here tonight. CO2, uh, highly hazardous upon release, uh, heavier than air, displaces oxygen, meaning it can cause asphyxiation of uh, both humans uh, and animals. Uh, this release can happen via those pipelines. Some of those pipelines might only be a couple of miles. Some of those pipelines uh, might be hundreds, if not thousands of miles. Uh, leaks, ruptures could lead to the release of CO2, as we've seen, not only down in Mississippi, but in other places recently as well. But we can also see releases of that supercritical CO2 uh, through migration to the surface uh, from those underground dumps, either through cracks, crevices, abandoned oil shafts, gas wells, those sort of things. Lots of concerns about the ability of that CO2 to migrate uh, vertically upwards and, and cause harm to human and animals. Significant risk contaminating water. We're talking about drilling deep into geological formations where aquifers are, drinking wells are, our underground sources of drinking water are. There's concerns about uh, contaminating uh, drinking water 
And then, of course, you know, stimulation of seismic activity, lots of concerns about the, the impact that the supercritical CO2 under that high pressure will have below ground, especially in areas that are prone uh, to seismic activity and a, a history of earthquakes. And uh, uh, we know, you know, through uh, the experience with the disposal of the hazardous fluids from hydrofracking that we're seeing, uh, you know, earthquakes in those areas, seismic activity in those areas of Oklahoma, Ohio, uh, and other places. CCS requires what is known as a class six permit. Class six permit was created back in 2010 is an exclusively and specifically for the underground storage or sequestration of uh, CO2. Um, uh, class six permits can be issued first by the EPA. The EPA has only issued four uh, permits that are active. Two of those are in Indiana. Two of those are in Illinois. In Illinois, that's, uh, you know, the ADM, the Archer Daniels Midland Ethanol Plant uh, indicator. And then, of course, what we're here to talk about tonight is Wabash Valley Resources, otherwise known as Wabash Carbon Services, who have two class uh, two permits for two of their planned CO2 dumps, one in Vigo and one in Vermilion County. But as we'll discuss throughout tonight, uh, you know, they have the initial permit to construct. They do not yet have uh, their permit or permission to inject. Um, so long way to go yet for Wabash in terms of their efforts out there in, in Vigo and Vermilion County. Uh, but you can also apply as a state to have primacy over the issuance of class six permits, uh, granting the state that authority rather than the EPA. Currently, three states have primacy for those class six permits, uh, North Dakota, Wyoming, Louisiana, and I believe West Virginia, Texas, and Arizona have pending applications to uh, receive primacy over class six permitting. But under those uh, privacy permits, uh, 11 uh, Class 6 permits have been issued with eight in North Dakota and three in Wyoming to date. There's uh, four phases to the permitting process for the Class 6 permit. The application gets submitted. There's a pre-construction review where uh, the EPA and other folks look at the geological and hydrogeological information engineering information and of course financial information re related to the wherewithal of uh, whatever company is, is is filing the application to build the project, see the project through from start to finish. Uh, Pre-operation permits where they uh, evaluate uh, the construction of the of the well sites, making sure that they're adequate to um, you know seal in and, and not uh, not leak. Um, and that is when they would receive permission to inject once the pre-operation analysis has been done. And that has not occurred yet uh, with Wabash Valley. Um, then there is the injection phase where they get the permission to the inject and they uh, start to inject. Then the EPA and the permitting requires confirming that they're in compliance with the permit requirements. And of course, that under so underground sources of drinking water are also protected and safe. And then there is the post injection phase of the class six permit. Most per permits will be for the life of the project. In the case of Wabash Valley Resources, that's 12 years. That's when they will have to close the site, plug the well. And then there's a 50 year post closure monitoring of requirement related to uh, the sequestered supercritical CO2. And most, most notably ensuring that uh, water is protected and safe. Uh, there's some application requirements related to class six permit. Uh, these are not all of them. This isn't all inclusive, but this is what we're talking about tonight. First of all, seismic activity uh, in the area, uh, detailed information on the CO2 stream or the CO2 plume, uh, which Dan and Steve will be talking about. Effectively, we're talking about CO2 after it's ejected, it's injected into those aquifers, those brine formations, uh, and it will migrate over time. And so detailed information on identifying the AOR, that's known as the area of review where they expect the CO2 to migrate over time, chemical properties of CO2, uh, reviewing preventing movement of CO2 and minimizing eliminating contact uh, with drinking water. And then there's also demonstrating suitable geology, uh, which many of us believe uh, Wabash Valley Resources has not yet done uh, with respect to their two proposed sites. Uh, we need site-specific analysis and data, geochemical data on subsurface formations, properties of the storage sites, so on and so forth. So we need to evaluate the potential for seismic activity, uh, detailed information on what exactly that CO2 plume 
is going to do underground, where it's going to go, and is that geology suitable uh, for this long-term uh, storage of CO2 and minimizing, if not eliminating, a migration or potential harm to human animals and our water supplies. And there's some permit required plans. I put testing and monitoring at the top and, and emphasize it as that's uh, something our, our experts are going to talk about tonight, the monitoring of that CO2 plume over time uh, and the inadequacy of what Wabash Valley Resources has proposed. But there's other plans uh, that they have to submit, such as injection well plugging, site plan for closure plan, post-injection care, corrective action, emergency remediation response, and quality assurance surveillance. But these are the plans that are required to be submitted through a class six permit. <clears throat> and I just quickly, since we're talking Indiana here, we're talking Wabash Valley, quickly wanted to go over uh, the policy that has been passed in the state of Indiana to date related to uh, carbon capture and storage and, and the related pipeline uh, infrastructure, just quickly. Um, 2011, we had Senate Act 251, and that is when eminent domain uh, for CO2 pipelines was granted to private entities. Uh, for those that recall, that was for the uh, Indiana gasification proposed substitute natural gas plant that CAC and others uh, uh, fought for a number of years and, of course, uh, never happened because it was a crazy idea. Nevertheless, the Indiana General Assembly did grant eminent domain to private operators of CO2 pipelines in Indiana back in 2011. Senate Enrolled Act 442, which we'll talk just a little bit about, was first bill for Wabash Valley Resources that created uh, the pilot project uh, for Wabash Valley uh, Resources back in 2019. And then in 2022, 2023, we had more activity related to CCS with two big bills. The first bill being House Enrolled Act 1209 back in 2022, otherwise known as the BP bill uh, for their massive project in Northwest Indiana. Uh, but that effectively 1209 created a statewide framework for the regulation, the permitting, et cetera, deal of, of CO2 pipelines and the CO2 storage wells with one exception. Wabash Valley Resources asked for and received a special exemption uh, from House Enrolled Act 1209 and those related regulations, basically meaning anybody in Indiana that wants to do uh, CO2 pipelines, CO2 storage wells must comply with the provisions within House Enrolled Act 1209, unless you're Wabash Valley. In 2020, 2023, they got their own bill, Senate Enrolled Act 451, exclusively and only for Wabash Valley, which I'll talk about briefly uh, here in a minute. And then we had Alton Rolled Act 1626, which granted DNR rulemaking authority related to CO2 pipelines and CO2 storage dumps. And I only mention that because we still don't have rules. We have no state rules yet governing CO2 storage wells and CO2 pipelines. And so that is cause for concern as we have lots of folks out there looking at doing this in the state of Indiana right now. And then at the federal level, we also have uh, FIMSA, the Pipeline Administration, updating the current federal rule uh, related to uh, CCS activities. So effectively we have, uh, you know, no rules governing, um, you know, these processes in the state of Indiana and soon to have updated federal rules, which is exactly why in Illinois, they did a two year moratorium on CCS projects unless and until, you know, we figure this stuff out and we have some rules for governing health and safety and protecting the public. Quickly on Senate Enrolled Act 451, which I know many on this call are familiar with, but effectively it gives a broad liability protection for Wabash Valley resources, shifting the burden of proof for any damage or harm to the property owner, limits the amount of monetary relief uh, owed to those that may be harmed, uh, and it gave Wabash Valley resources the right to inject prior to notifying customers. What do I mean by that? Senate Enrolled Act 451. Uh, the statute reads that they inform property owners upon the expected migration of the CO2, meaning even if they believe at some point in time CO2 may reach your property underneath your home, underneath your farm, underneath your school, all Bass Valley resources can go ahead and inject uh, without notifying you and only has to notify you pursuant to the law upon the expected migration of that CO2. And that bill applies only to Vermilion and Vigo counties, <laughs> raising some constitutional issues. And it applies only and specifically to Wabash Valley Resources pilot project, which one would think would also violate Indiana's code of special legislation, but they passed it anyway. Uh, 
Going back just a step real quick, the Senate enrolled Act 442 in 2019. That was the bill that established Wabash Valley Resources as a pilot project. Uh, I have an article here about that bill. CAC worked hard on that bill. We worked actually closely with Wabash Valley Resources, and uh, we succeeded in, in getting that bill effectively turned into a summer study committee uh, on, on CCS and the wisdom of doing CCS. Um, we thought it was a good idea. Why doesn't Indiana take a deep dive on this before um, you know, we move forward with this? So um, that's how the bill left the General Assembly was largely as, hey, we're going to take a look at this and do a, do a deep dive study. But then later on in May, when study tips topics were assigned to committees, guess what? Uh, no study of carbon storage was done. Um, the study was not scheduled. No study was done. Um, and that was highly, highly concerning as many, many things are happening in the background right now. Many concerns are being raised and the state um, did not decide to move forward with a comprehensive study on the wisdom of carbon storage, despite, uh, as the bill said in 2019, that the underground storage of carbon dioxide is declared as a matter of legislative determination to be a public use and service in the public interest and a benefit to the welfare and people of Indiana. I'm not sure what legislative determination was when the legislature barely took a look at the issue and is proceeding forward with this stuff without having done any sort of comprehensive review from the General Assembly, from DNR, from IDEM, or any state agency. Um, so cause for concern. And then I'm going to stop here uh, and just show that uh, after that bill passed, after the study was canceled, that's when Wabash Valley uh, started getting to work out there with doing some seismic testing back in July 2019. I got a call from some folks out there asking, hey, what are these funny things on the side of the road? Uh, what's this all about? I went out there. There was a couple of miles strewn across uh, several roads of these wires and boxes, and nobody had any idea what it was. Uh, so I wanted to show this picture to our audience. So if you see those things uh, on the side of the road in the ditch by your house, by your farm, that's what's going on. It's seismic testing um, for potential uh, underground storage of CCS, and it is all over the place in Indiana right now. And with that, I will turn it over uh, to Dan and Steve uh, uh, to educate us all. Thanks so much. Apologize, give me a moment here to fire up the share screen thing. And get this. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Kerwin. Our purpose today is to technically evaluate, discuss Wabash Valley Resources application for carbon sequestration permits, specifically as it relates to containment by the geologic seal and the injection of CO2 into the designated reservoir interval. WVR has submitted technical information and corporate assurances supporting their contention that CO2 injection would comply with all safety guidelines mandated by the federal EPA regulations. Due to time constraints, we will examine only three of the key subsurface issues related to their application to see if you agree that Wabash Valley Resources has satisfied the federal safety requirements and that those assurances are valid. The three main issues for discussion today are, number one, the lack of historic earthquakes shows that there is no active faulting occurring today within the area of investigation. Number two, interpretation of 2D seismic lines shows there are no faults that might have breached the containment interval from a coconut shale. And number three, analysis of geologic assumptions related to the underground CO2 plume and a proposed program to monitor that plume. I want to apologize in advance if this discussion becomes somewhat technical, but these are highly technical issues and deserve honest technical analysis. So here we go. This is a map showing all the recorded earthquakes in Indiana since 1817. There's a total of just 44 recorded events and they range in magnitude from magnitude 4.8 to magnitude 3. This earthquake data is provided by the Indiana Geologic Survey, recorded by the Indiana Earthquake Network. 
This map showing the location of those 44 recorded earthquakes is included in the WVR earthquake risk analysis. When the map is expanded to include all the recorded earthquakes in Indiana and in Illinois, we can see many more earthquakes were recorded in Illinois, nearly 250 additional events. And the dotted red line shows a radius of about 100 miles from the proposed injection site indicated by the yellow star. And now the data shows that within this 100 mile radius, 80 earthquakes have been recorded, one with a magnitude of 5.4 in just the past 20 years. However, the real problem with using recorded earthquake data as a method for determining fault activity is that earthquake networks don't record all the earthquakes. In fact, not even 1% of them. When discussing earthquake data, it's important to understand this chart, which shows a relationship between magnitude, intensity, and energy. The magnitude scale is not linear, it's logarithmic. Each magnitude level is 10 times larger than the previous level, creating a 12 orders of magnitude range of energy levels. The instruments that are designed to record this enormous range of energy are known as strong motion instruments but they only record the upper range of magnitudes, which actually is just 1% of the total number of earthquakes, as shown by the white portion of the graph. As you can see, magnitude 3.0 is the lowest magnitude level registered by these strong motion networks because the instruments are simply not designed to register below that level. That's very unfortunate because the vast majority of earthquakes have magnitudes less than magnitude three, as shown by the area within the yellow portion of this chart. These events are called micro earthquakes, and there's millions of micro earthquakes each year compared to just a few thousand of the larger events. So the relatively few earthquakes recorded by strong motion networks are literally just the tip of the iceberg. For every magnitude four earthquake, for example, there are 100 magnitude two events and 1000 magnitude one events. However, just because micro earthquakes are not detected and are not cataloged in the official USGS files doesn't mean they don't exist. In fact, micro earthquakes provide the most comprehensive evidence of current fault activity and they can provide precise coordinate data of active fault locations. But the problem is, how can these micro earthquakes be detected then? The answer is by using dense networks with 3D seismic geophones. As an example, let's look at a recent project from Southern California. The Southern California Seismic Network, operated by Caltech, relies on strong motion instruments just like those used in Indiana. Map on the left shows the location of strong motion or instruments used in this network as red triangles. There's about 30 of them on this map. Clusters of earthquakes that were recorded by this network are indicated by the red dots, and they are associated with major active fault systems. California agencies and the USGS use this data to regulate construction projects, create zoning codes, develop engineering criteria, and to update safety regulations throughout the greater Los Angeles area. And yes, the California Strong Motion Instruments also have a detection threshold of magnitude three, just like the ones in Indiana. One of the more enigmatic faults running through Southern California is known as the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone, labeled NIFZ on the USGS maps. Between 2010 and 2017, three different dense networks that I referred to are indicated by the red, purple, and blue outlines on the left slide were installed along a portion of the NIFC to try to better understand the behavior of this particular fault system. In 2017, 3D Seismic Solutions was responsible for designing and recording the largest of the three dense networks, the blue network, encompassing a 28 square mile urban area, including extending one and a half miles offshore. Dense networks use 3D seismic geophones, like those used by the oil industry for mapping high resolution 3D surveys. But unlike earthquake networks, seismic geophones are placed just 100 feet apart to provide precise detection and precise locations of even the smallest signals. The thousand 
of seismic geophones that were used in the dense networks are shown by the red, purple, and blue dots on the slide on the right. Seismic geophones are extremely sensitive and can detect the motion, for example, of trees swaying in the wind, traffic on highways, even planes landing at nearby airports, and they can record micro earthquakes as small as magnitude 0 0.1. Consequently, these geophones and the dense networks record an entirely different subset of micro earthquake events specifically those that occur within the yellow areas of the magnitude chart we just looked at. This map shows the micro-earthquake results from just several months of monitoring by the dense networks. Epicenters of more than 1,260 events were identified, ranging in magnitude from 0 0.1 up to magnitude 3, with depths that were calculated down to one and a half miles deep, as you can see on the color chart. These events apply a frequency of more than 10,000 micro-earthquakes per year within the study area. However, none of these events were recorded by the existing strong motion instruments because they occurred below the network's threshold of detection. Far more surprising, however, is the fact that very few of the recorded micro-earthquakes coincided with USGS fault maps, including along the Newport Inglewood fault zone. In fact, most of the recorded events were clustered in areas where the USGS previously thought no faults existed. However, subsequent 3D seismic reflection surveys, as well as independent analysis by Caltech, confirmed that these micro-earthquake events are occurring along previously unknown faults extending as deep as 14,000 feet into the basement. Caltech has subsequently published several papers on these surprising results, and 3D Seismic Solutions has named two of the newly identified faults and has mapped many others that were previously unknown. Most importantly, however, the data proves that these new faults are currently active and pose a very real threat to the local population, but they are not being detected by the existing earthquake networks. As I said, traditional earthquake networks only record the tip of the iceberg while dense networks using highly sensitive seismic geophones provide far more detailed information about active fault locations and their level of activities. Dense networks can be built for purpose, meaning they can be specifically customized, and they provide information about an important subset of earthquakes that is not being recorded by traditional networks, and they can even detect small faults that might be below the resolution of reflection seismic surveys. So, the earthquake analysis submitted by Wabash Valley Resources disregards thousands of micro-earthquakes associated with hundreds of unmapped faults, and it implies that CO2 can only leak from faults associated with earthquakes greater than magnitude 3. Common sense tells us that is simply not true. WVR also submitted interpreted copies of three oil industry seismic lines to support their conclusion that, quote, there are no faults to compromise the integrity of the CO2 containment system, unquote. During the 1980s, 1990s, I personally designed, recorded, processed, and interpreted tens of thousands of miles of similar 2D data, and I'm very familiar with the data quality issues associated with this type of data recording and with the data processing techniques that are required to make the data usable. The main problem with this 2D data is data quality. The seismic lines were acquired using shallow sources as the energy for recording reflections, a practice which creates tremendous surface noise that contaminates and interferes with the desired reflections. Typical processing efforts to remove this noise and enhance the signals invariably results in severe reduction of the vertical resolution of the data. Now, we have submitted freedom of information requests for the seismic lines, which were used and submitted by WVR, so that we can independently evaluate the resolution of the seismic to determine whether the WVR interpretations are valid. 
While we wait for the information to be provided, however, we are fortunate to have the results of a similar processing report published by a graduate student at Wright State University in the year 2012. So we can use their results in our calculations as examples. This slide demonstrates how large amplitude horizontally propagating surface noise, which is the um, displacement shown by the solid red arrows, are known as Rayleigh waves, and they occur simultaneously with vertically propagating but much weaker reflection energy shown by the dotted red lines. The shallow explosions or shallow uh, perturbations at the surface, which were used as a source energy for these lines, considerably amplify those Rayleigh waves and they can easily overwhelm and obscure the desired reflections. The job of seismic data processors then is to separate and remove the noise frequencies while preserving the signal energy. The data processor arbitrarily decides which data are good and which are bad, mostly by trial and error, until the desired results are obtained. The workhorse algorithms traditionally used to accomplish this noise removal are known as FK filters and radon filters. While such algorithms may remove some of the contaminating noise, they invariably do so by decreasing the frequency content of the data, thereby reducing the resolution of the data. Since the late 1990s, most modern processing centers have realized that these old school filtering algorithms are simply too heavy handed to produce valid data. Modern processing data centers use much more sophisticated techniques, which become viable with customized 3D data sets. I want to very quickly show you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. Here you can see the initial data recorded from two separate shots, one on the left and a different one on the right. The stronger, deeply dipping, discontinuous events are the noise, the Rayleigh waves. Underlying the noise, there are weaker horizontal reflections, which are nearly invisible due to the contamination by the Rayleigh waves. The two different energy modes simultaneously overlap each other, resulting in destructive interference of the wavelengths and the frequencies. Now let me show you what happens when FK filters are applied, attempting to remove the noise. This is an example of one of those lines after applying just one iteration of FK filtering. The FK filtering, you recall, attempts to subtract the dipping events and leave only the horizontal events. Notice that the data we saw in the previous slide has now been realigned into very low frequency, approximately horizontal reflections. If you try to follow individual reflections within the yellow box, however, this is the area corresponding to the primary seal and injection zones for the WVR project. You can see that these reflections are discontinuous, segmented, and very difficult to follow. WVR acknowledge this in their application when they said that the reflections are difficult to follow. This is due to the destructive interference effects that I mentioned. You can also see lots of remaining noise crossing through the zone at about 45 degrees, especially at the edges of the line. Also notice the overall synclinal trough-like shape of these reflections. This is the same line, except now this is after three iterations of FK filtering have been applied instead of just the one. Now the data looks more horizontally continuous and the reflection amplitudes appear more balanced, but the reflections have also been realigned, smoothed out and inverted into an anaclinal shape. This is what FK filtering does. The interval that WVR is supposed to evaluate for possible faults is shown inside the yellow box. This zone contains the critical intervals for the Wabash project. You can see the reflections are still segmented, broken, and indistinct. And is the interval faulted? Well, maybe. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, this is ugly, poor quality, badly compromised data with very low signal to noise ratios. These results are typical of, of data recorded using shallow surface energy sources. They're 2D seismic lines acquired primarily in the decades of the 80s and 90s, but have mostly been subsequently abandoned. FK filtering algorithms are able to alter the structural integrity of the data and obscure evidence of faulting, which is frightening. I'll show you just how frightening in a moment. As a result of the data subtraction by this FK filtering, the frequency content of the data has also been significantly reduced and consequently the vertical resolution is terrible. 
Now, the reason I've taken you down this path of ugly processing is to show you just how poor the data quality is of these type of 2D lines and how manipulated the structural details are and how and why the data is processed that way. Yellow and black area of the chart on the left shows the initial frequency range of the data before FK filtering was applied. It has a respectable bandwidth of about 10 to 90 hertz, and the dominant frequency of the data is 45 hertz, indicated by the red arrow slide on the left we're talking about. The chart on the right, however, shows the remaining bandwidth after FK filtering. All the high frequencies that were in the yellow portion of the spectrum have been removed by the filter, and the remaining bandwidth is now just 10 to 30 hertz, and the dominant frequency is just 20 hertz. I'm emphasizing the dominant frequency because that's what determines the vertical resolution of the data. In other words, the dominant frequency determines what the data can actually see. And why is this important? Well, understanding the limits of the data is essential to evaluating how realistic an interpretation is. If an interpretation cites details that cannot be seen by the data, the interpretation is unrealistic. So let me ask you a question. Do you think that this 2D data is capable of detecting a World War II era battleship? For example, the USS Missouri, if she was buried at the same level as the Makokata Shale? In other words, could we see Mighty Mo using this seismic data with a dominant frequency of 20 Hertz? Before you jump off the answer, look, I'll give you a hint. The USS Missouri is 216 feet tall from its keel to the top of the mast. So I know this is a little geeky, but I think it's important to show the calculations for what the 2D data is realistically capable of revealing about the Makokata interval. The vertical resolution of the data is determined by the seismic wavelength. The formula for calculating the wavelength is a function of the interval velocity of the zone, which is about 20,000 feet per second for the Makokata group, divided by the dominant frequency of the data, which as I showed you is 20 Hertz. The result of those calculations is a wavelength of about 1,000 feet. With such poor quality signal-to-noise data, the best resolution that can be expected is about one-half to one-third of that seismic wavelength. In the following calculations, I've tried to be generous and use one-third of the wavelength to determine the minimum vertical resolution. In this case, the calculated minimal Vertical resolution is 333 feet, one third of the wavelength. That means with this data quality, that's the thinnest zone that can be clearly imaged by the seismic. So the answer to the battleship question is the USS Missouri, 216 feet tall, 887 feet long, and 108 feet wide would be invisible on this data. And their application to the EPA WBR states that the thickness of the entire Makokata group is 314 feet thick, which, just like the battleship, is still less than the minimum seismic resolution. Consequently, this data analysis shows that the 2D seismic is unable to image the Makokata shale group, the primary containment zone for the CO2 injection project. Let me say that again. Because of the low dominant frequency of the data caused by bad processing and the high interval velocity, of the Makokata group. The critical containment zone is below the minimum resolution of the seismic data. The Potosi dolomite injection zone is even thinner and has faster velocities and is also invisible. The reason is that this 2D seismic was never designed to provide the level of resolution necessary to address the injection permit requirements. So is it even possible to acquire sufficient data quality to answer these questions? Yes, it is, but such detailed seismic information can only be acquired using built-for-purpose, custom-designed and custom-processed 3D seismic data. Let's compare the previous calculations to actual data submitted by WBR by examining one of the interpreted seismic lines that was included in their permit application. This is seismic line 2000. And for reference, the vertical scale on the left is labeled in time increments of 100 milliseconds, as indicated by the yellow bracket. The 314 foot thick Makokata group occurs within the interval between the turquoise line and the dark blue line immediately below it. 
an interval just 31 milliseconds thick. That's the interval where the crucial fault information should be. Compare that interval to the yellow bracket on the left showing 100 milliseconds of time. A 150 foot fault in this interval would offset only half of the shale zone and would appear as a 15 millisecond offset in time, almost invisible. It's also worth mentioning that geometry issues affect 2D lines. Offsets caused by faults which might cross the seismic line diagonally would not display a sharp vertical break of the reflection, but would curve smoothly from the upthrown to the downthrown fault blocks. This is a response caused by the Fresnel zone. That's how 2D data works. You can see several wavy, similar wavy undulations within the Makoka interval, but it's impossible to say whether those wavy intervals are caused by oblique faulting, such as I just mentioned, or by smeared data resulting from bad processing. Unfortunately, there are no nearby offsetting seismic lines to confirm the strike orientation of such faults. So a definitive interpretation is not possible with this 2D grid. However, in their report, WBR stated, quote, there are no faults observed within this sedimentary package, unquote. Those comments may be technically correct, but the conclusions are very misleading. The entire storage complex for the WBR project, including the Potosi injection zone, lies within the interval on the seismic between the turquoise line and the black line labeled top of the Eau Claire shale. A 150-foot fault in this zone would have just 13 milliseconds of offset, about the thickness of the interpreted lines that you see. There are several potential offsets of this magnitude within the storage complex interval, but again, without corroboration of the interpretation from adjacent lines, the data is inconclusive. Notice that neither the Makoka shale nor the Potosi dolomite have been identified on this data. The WVR report states that reflections within this interval are, quote, difficult to follow, unquote. This is exactly the kind of ambiguous seismic response to be expected from data sets that cannot resolve the necessary details. Do you think anyone can honestly and confidently report, quote, the lack of faulting in the storage complex indicates containment is not compromised, unquote. Well, that's what WVR concluded. And finally, here's a couple of other statements provided by WBR regarding the geological integrity of the CO2 storage complex. Remember, their conclusions are based mostly on, number one, the lack of recorded earthquakes reported by those strong motion earthquake networks, and number two, on their interpretations of low resolution 2D seismic lines. I wanna give you just a couple of seconds to read their comments in light of our discussion today. In summary, neither the historic earthquake data nor the 2D seismic are appropriate for responding to EPA requirements related to safe containment and storage of CO2. The data simply does not support the conclusions which have been submitted by WBR. A more appropriate data set capable of legitimately addressing the technical criteria required by the EPA regulations could be provided by acquiring a built for purpose customized 3D seismic data set over the project areas using dense network geophones, which is now the industry standard. But this is a step that WVR has failed to take. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce my associate, Steve Bolgen, with whom I have had the pleasure of working for the past 14 years. Steve will discuss the injection zone and the CO2 plume for this project. Steve is not only a highly experienced geologist, but also a world-class petrophysicist. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Jump into the, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> All right, this slide is the stratigraphic column of the rocks discussed in the Wabash permit application. The two main formations of interest are the Moquette, the Makoketa, which provides the primary seal for the CO2 containment, and the Potosi, which is the reservoir for the injected CO2. The depths to the right are from the top of the Makoketa and the Potosi injection zone, as they were encountered in the Wabash number one well. During this part, I'm going to focus mostly on the, or actually exclusively on the Potosi dolomite. 
Wabash has described the Potosi as a fine to coarsely crystalline, commonly dense dolomite, but contains mm -hmm. characteristic druzy quartz and intercalations of vugular, brecciated, fractured, and or cavernous intervals. What a mouthful, especially for people that don't deal with geology on a regular basis. Let's take a look at what they're talking about. The Potosi underlies most of the Illinois basin and it outcrops in only a few selected areas. Therefore, Potosi rocks available for visual inspection are either from these few selected outcrops or from cores taken in the deeper wells. The left image here is from the quarry in Ugal County, Illinois, the Potosi Dolomite, and it's approximately 215 miles from Vigo County. The left image, is from the type locality for the Potosi Dolomite, which is in the town of Potosi, Missouri. I'd like to bring your attention here to the two, we call them VUGs, and the slight fracture that is separating or connecting those two VUGs. Let me explain, in geologic parlance, we look at porosity is the intergranular floor space. In other words, if you put a lot of basketballs together in a box, you're going to have space in between those basketballs. That's the porosity. Vugs are usually orders of magnitude larger than those intergrain porosities. So here we have large vugs in this dolomite connected by a fracture. Now let's take a look at the Potosi in the underground domain. Both of these images come from a single well in Macon County, Illinois. The left image is from a depth of 4,550 feet and shows several vugs partially to almost completely filled with quartz, as well as a fracture network with varying amounts of filling. The right image is from the same well from a depth 20 feet above the left image and shows a very different porosity and permeability system. In this right-hand image, there are many vugs and they appear to be isolated cavities as we cannot see any connecting fracture network between the vugs. The sample to the left will have measurable porosity and permeability. The sample on the right will have measurable porosity, but extremely low permeability. And what we mean by that is it has a capacity to store stuff, but you can't get the material into the storage compartments because there are no cracks connecting them. One more example of the Potosi in the subsurface. In the upper left image, this is a sample from a road cut in Washington County, Missouri. And I just put this up there. You can see the size of the cavities and the quartz crystal linings inside those cavities. Below that is a photograph of a piece of core from a well in Monroe County, Illinois, that's been slabbed to show the fracturing and cavernous porosity present in that part of the Potosi. To the right of that are a series of photographs from core taken from an exploratory well in St. Louis County, Missouri. In this well, the Potosi is fractured, brecciated, and exhibits fuggy porosity. So between all these images, it can be concluded that there is both lateral and vertical porosity and permeability variations within the Potosi. None of those characteristics, porosity and permeability, are homogeneous. Both the vugs, which is the main pore space in the rock, and the fractures, which provide minimal pore space, but do the connecting between the vugs, are completely variable within the Potosi. However, Wabash in their permit application to the APA states, and I'll quote, the spatial distribution of the collective confining zones and injection zone is assumed to be relatively uniform within the area of review. However, this interpretation is constrained by a lack of nearby data, unquote. With this statement, I believe Wabash is assuming a relatively uniform distribution of the pore space and the fracture network but then they immediately couch that by saying there are not any nearby data examples to substantiate that statement. I firmly believe that with the variability of the porosity and fracture distribution, 
in the Potosi intervals, there will be a direct influence on how the plume grows and the shape it takes during and after the CO2 injection. If Wabash is to realistically model the anticipated plume growth, this variability needs to be part of their model. That I believe is not the case because you'll see later, they have assumed a radial distribution to their CO2 injection plume. 10 years ago, Dr. Hannes Lataro published a paper in which he discussed the risks of using the Potosi as a target reservoir. He had some very insightful concerns, issues he hoped his study would bring to the forefront and that any sequestration project would have to satisfy to get approval. This is some text I took directly from his paper. However, there are three important parts of this I'd like to bring to your attention. The first is lateral consistency and continuity of the porosity and permeability. Interesting, we already took a good look at that. Through all of Dr. Lataro's work in the Potosi, he was well aware of the variability of the porosity and permeability, and he quantified that variability as a risk until it is better understood. He goes on to mention the ability to predict and track the development of the CO2 plume. As mentioned earlier, plume development is directly related to the porosity and permeability distribution at each individual injection site. Since the porosity and permeability distribution is different, is, excuse me, is difficult to quantify, plume monitoring becomes critical. Finally, Dr. Lataro is concerned about the faulting and justifiably so. He's not too concerned about the regional picture. He wants to know about it on a site-specific basis. Faults are the prime mechanism by which the injected CO2 can escape the targeted injection intervals. So speaking of faults, let's look at one more indicator of the potential for faulting in the area. This is a regional west to east cross section through Southern Illinois and into Indiana. You can see the little insert map in the bottom right hand corner. On this section are plotted chloride concentrations of fluid samples taken from various depths in the Illinois basin. Dissolved solids are measured by the fluid's ability to transmit an electric current. The ability to do that is because of the presence of negative ions. In this case, they're chloride ions. Chloride then typically combines with salt and you get sodium chloride. I mean, see, combines with sodium and you get sodium chloride, which is salt. Thereby, if you can measure the chloride content in the water, which is easily done electrically, you can make an assumption of the salinity of the water. In this cross section, the purple dots, the lowest in the cross section, represent the highest saturation of chlorides, 150,000 milligrams per liter and higher. These are concentrations so high that the water is completely unsuitable for drinking, irrigation, and just about everything else. To put this in a reference framework, the USGS considers fresh water to be less than 1,000 milligrams per liter. Slightly saline water is between one and 3,000, and highly saline water is 10,000 to 35,000 milligrams per liter. And for your reference, Salt water on average is about 35,000 milligrams per liter. That's seawater. Now we'll focus on these small red dots. They represent concentrations between 100 and 5,000 milligrams per liter, which is essentially drinking water. Across most of the Illinois basin on the left side of this cross section, these dots are all confined to the uppermost sections of the stratigraphic section there. However, as you start approaching the Indiana border, you come across the Clay City Anticline. See that large anticline sitting there, the red arrows pointing to it? I notice there, oh, we have some orange to red dots at a depth that is, if you look on the right side, that depth column is in meters. So we're looking at 2,000 feet below ground level. 
we go a little further into Indiana, into Vigo County, and we have some solid red dots at the same depth. And if you look on either side of those red dots, we have concentrations of chloride that are 10 times higher. So my question is, how are we gonna get fresh water to that depth without it mixing with the surrounding waters? One solution to that is faults and fractures. They are pathways that will allow the fresh water to percolate deep into the ground without mixing with any of the conate waters in the surrounding formations. So could the presence of these fresh water results 2,100 feet below ground level where everywhere else at this depth, it's salt water. Could these be indicating the presence of faults and fractures? I'll leave that to you to contemplate. However, our solution to that is we can address this by building that for purpose 3D seismic survey Dan was talking about. And we can see the, inter the fault potential in both of these areas. Oop, my apologies here, wrong button. Previous surveys of this type using these dense arrays, they run for 24 seven. And as Dan pointed out, not only can we identify the faulting, we can also pick up the micro seismic events and we can find out if these faults are active, if they're currently moving. All right, the last thing I wanna get, I know we're getting a little long here, is I wanna take a look at this map that was submitted on page 16 of Wabash's permit application narrative. A lot of information on this map, so please bear with me. First of all on here, plotted in purple, are the plume outlines that is a result of Wabash's modeling after 12 years of injection and 50 years of post-injection site care. So after 62 years, this is where they expect the plume to be. The project then has two confinement monitoring wells. These are shown with a yellow cross in each plume area. Also as part of the project are two formation monitoring wells indicated with a green cross at the extreme northeastern edge of each plume. And just for reference, the gold star there, that is the location of the Wabash number one well. Now these confinement wells, the yellow crosses are described as being drilled into the Silurian, which is immediately above the primary seal. That's the Makuketa. The purpose of these wells is to continuously monitor temperature and pressure and to allow for fluid sampling of the Silurian. And as Wabash states then that any significant deviation could be evidence of compromise of the primary seal. However, when I look in their application and their other reports, there is no baseline temperature and pressure of the Silurian that's been mentioned. And there is no value what would be considered a significant deviation from these things. So that is still undefined. One other thing I noticed with these wells mm -hmm. being in the Silurian, which is above the primary seal, that to detect any significant deviations, especially in the fluid chemistry, the CO2 plume will have already compromised the primary seal. To me, this is akin to your neighbor telling you to close the barn door after your cows are out because they're in his garden. And then he invites you over for steak dinner. All right, finally, let's take a look at these formation monitoring wells, the green crosses on there. I don't know how they picked the location for these wells, but if you notice here, they are on the extreme edge of the plume 62 years after they begin injection. And I note there are only two formation monitoring wells, one for each plume. If Wabash was really intent on monitoring this plume development, especially during the 12 years of the CO2 injection, you would be drilling multiple monitoring wells radiating out from the injection well. That is obviously not the case here. My point is what good are these two wells to monitor the plume 
when the plume's not expected to reach the wells for 62 years. I don't think they would be much use to anybody at any time out there. Our solution to this is to run what we call a 4D seismic program. We can start with the initial program prior to injection, where we would identify the faults and look at the micro seismic. That would be our baseline. We would see the formation prior to any CO2 injection. Going forward, once injection starts on an annual basis, we could deploy the nodes and the sources in the exact same location, record the data and interpret it. And any changes we see in the subsurface could be attributed directly to the CO2 plume. So we would know on an annual basis and from a dense network exactly where that CO2 is expanding to. The only other option I see for this would be to drill those multiple plume monitoring wells, which my gosh, that would be unbelievably expensive. Plus you would have the continual monitoring and maintenance expenses for each of those multiple wells. I think the 3D seismic is a much more economical and gives you a much better resolution as to where the plume is. All right, in summary then, the existing 2D data, as Dan pointed out, is inadequate to resolve the features required for a class six permit. The data is far too noisy and extensive filtering was applied to remove the noise, which also removed many of the features one needs to identify the injection zone, the primary seal and any faulting. The 2D data can only resolve features that are more than 330 feet tall. Faults less than 330 feet of displacement will not be visible. The Potosi porosity interval, which is only 10 to 20 feet thick, will certainly not be visible. And the entire Makoketa group at 314 feet in total thickness, and of which the primary seal is only a subset of that, cannot be resolved on the 2D data set. The Wabash number one well represents a nine inch hole that was drilled three and a half miles from the Southern injection well and eight miles from the Northern injection well and was used to imply the relatively uniform porosity and permeability distribution throughout both injection areas. As you saw, concern was been professionally raised at least 10 years ago regarding the lateral consistency and continuity of these properties. Radial plume development in the lat in the Potosi injection intervals has been assumed based in part on Wabash's concept from the Wabash number one well that the porosity and permeability are uniformly distributed throughout both areas of review. I firmly believe that cannot be the case. Two formation monitoring wells are inadequate to monitor temperature and pressure in the injection zone and to track plume development. The positioning of these wells at the extreme edge of the plume at the end of 62 years makes those wells relatively worthless. I truly feel that these issues are solvable and the questions that we bring up are answerable by using the appropriate technology and concepts we have laid out, notably, the 3D seismic and the dense geophone grid. You cannot solve or adequately address the class six permit requirements by shoehorning old square peg data into round holes. It just, it just doesn't work. So with that, I say thank you so much for allowing us to be part of your evening and present all this data to you. I'll turn it over to Kerwin, who had a few comments to finish up with, and then I guess we can get on to questions and answers. All right, let me. Okay, now I lost where the. I'm still looking where to give you control here. I apologize. Oh, I think it's the top of the screen where it has the stop share. Yes, I see it there. Thank you. Sure thing. <laughs> oh, no. That's a different thing I'm seeing here. 
top of the screen. Well, I think you have to maximize the Zoom. I did. I did, and I sign in recording. No, I don't see it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out real fast, throw it back to you. And I, All right, no I worries. I apologize. No worries. Be right back. <clears throat> well, thank you for that, uh, Dan and Steve. I feel a whole lot smarter, and it feels like we should have uh, applied for CECs and CLEs and other things for that presentation. So uh, well done. We appreciate it. And yeah, just... Uh, you know, in closing, you know, remind us what those risks were that we talked about at the very beginning. Uh, potential contamination of our water, uh, stimulation of seismic activities and earthquakes, uh, you know, asphyxiation because of that migration uh, of that CO2 plume. And as, as we said, we need site-specific data, you know, about this stuff. And that site-specific data has just not been acquired yet. And that is a, a, a critical piece of information, uh, um, you know, that, that, that we need. And you know, we need adequate monitoring. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to, uh, you know, tie a bow up on this and say those risks are are real. Uh, we need more information. You know, this dirty data, this insufficient data, uh, you know, lack of transparency needs to end. And uh, we need uh, we need study. We need information. So with that, um, I'll point everybody, uh, you know, to our website, uh, CITACT.org, as well as we have a Web page dedicated exclusively to uh, Wabash Valley Resources, which is the second link there. And the third link there, the CCS-Indiana, that is an overview of, uh, to the best of our knowledge, all of the active projects in Indiana at some stage of development, although I've already heard about a few in the last couple of weeks that I don't think we even have uh, on our map. So lots of activity in Indiana. And uh, quickly, Kelly, if you don't mind, I, I did want to give a shout out to our good friends and the good folks out there in Vigo and Vermilion County, the concerned citizens against Wabash Valley resources who were taken by surprise through this whole thing um, and uh, are, are, are working hard uh, to stop this from happening in their community. Uh, there's a link to their Facebook group, but a shout out to the, to the good folks out there at the concerned citizens uh, doing great work. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Kelly. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kerwin. And again, thank you, Dan and Steve. I feel like across the three of you presenting tonight, we learned so much valuable information. So much appreciation. And thank you for the questions that are coming in. We are going to dive in with those right now. Uh, this first one, Dan, I believe this is a good uh, one to kick to you. Um, why are there so many more earthquakes in California than Indiana? Um, it has everything to do with plate tectonics. Uh, California is right on the border of uh, the plate boundary between North America and the Pacific plates, and they tend to be sliding sideways past each other. So consequently, that creates an awful lot of, of faults, such as the San Andreas that you're familiar with. But uh, there's uh, so many of them that just haven't yet been studied and haven't been investigated that it's an ongoing project. Now, the situation in Indiana is different because Indiana is sitting on a very old earthquake zone that was at one time apparently a, a rift system. And uh, there's still a lot of incipient stresses involved. And although it isn't as active as California, there are still earthquakes, as you've seen. And the point is from that little chart that I showed you, the little teepee looking chart, is that the number of earthquakes is exponential. So to point at any number at the top of that chart and say, oh, there's only 40 of these, you know, that sounds innocent, but it isn't because for those 40 that you see at the top, there's 40,000 down below that aren't being reported. And that's the danger. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you so much. Steve, I think this question is ripe for you. Um, on the slide with the purple plumes, the blue dots show water wells. 
We've got a question about whether those are private wells or utility wells with a follow-up question that how much higher are those wells than the proposed carbon dioxide injection? Good question there. I have not done the research to see if they are privately owned wells or utility owned wells. And I'm going to make a assumption, a guess, because again, I have not gone into the water wells specifically. I'm going to figure they are shallow wells because in the reports I've read, none of those wells can be used for anything regarding monitoring or evaluating the CO2. So those wells have to be shallow, uh, shallow source water wells in there. I, um, other than that, I'm terribly sorry. I don't have depths of those wells or anything else. I just know that they cannot be used for anything dealing with the CO2 injection. All good, Steve. Thank you so much for Certainly. that information. Okay, and then I'm going to let you fight over this, Dan and Steve, because I can't tell which one <laughs> is more appropriate, but we've got an excellent question. Um, what is the expected cost of a proper 3D scan and proper follow-ups versus the damage that could occur to our land, our animals, our humans, and any potential resulting lawsuits? I guess I'll... Yeah, give that a yeah, shot, Dan. <laughs> you know, we recorded uh, a number of 3D surveys that would be adequate for this kind of a project when we were in California, and we recorded different sizes of them. The smallest one that we recorded was uh, uh, three and a half square miles. So it's very focused, very tight, and the cost of that was $1 million dollars. Okay, now I know that sounds like a lot, but when you compare that cost against the cost of drilling these monitoring wells and to the overall cost of the project, which is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, then it's not such a bad uh, number to contemplate, especially considering the kind of very site-specific detailed information that gives you about the uh, earthquake activity levels, small faults that you might not even be able to see on a seismic survey, and then, of course, direct detection of the plume that you would get from that. So there's an awful lot of uh, bang for the buck in that kind of uh, investment. Absolutely. Any follow-up response, Steve? Or if No, that's, uh, that, that covers it very well. Uh, you know, I, I can't address anything about the comparison cost to loss of farmland, animals, um, sources of drinking water, anything of that sort, that would have to be done. You know, your local farmer's got a much better handle on that than I would. Sure. sure. Well, thank you both. Sure. And we've got another one that I am split between Dan and Steve on who's more appropriate to answer, but the uh, plume model is supposedly a two mile radius. And their model displayed a 62-year spread. Do you think it's feasible that over 1 million metric tons per year for 12 years will only spread for two miles? I'll jump on that one. Uh, that is completely dependent upon the porosity and the permeability down there. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, the more pore space there is, the less distance that CO2 will go because it can be contained, it can fill up those pores in a shorter distance. The lower the porosity gets, the further that plume is going to expand to find space to go into. And of course, that is all predicated on there being permeability for that CO2 to find its way into those pores and vugs. So, you know, looking at some of that data, the Potosi is quite vuggy in some places and not so vuggy in others. In other words, storage capacity is greater in some areas than in others. And, you know, as I said, they drilled a nine inch hole three and a half miles away and said, this is the porosity everywhere. We saw evidence that's not the case. So 
to say that plume is only going to be two miles in diameter, I would at this point tend to disagree with that. And I'll also go on a limb and say it's not going to be round. <laughs> I can't believe that everything is so uniformly distributed, you will get a very nice symmetrical distribution as you start injecting. It's going to follow the preferential path of least resistance through the porosity and the permeability. So whatever that system is, northwest, southeast, north, south, your, your, your plume's going to elongate along those directions. Thank you so much. Sure. Context. Um, Kerwin, you are up next. Um, which national and or state agency will review the risk critique and path forward suggestions outlined here tonight? Um, yeah, well, I mean, because of state statutes in Indiana, the state agencies have extremely limited authority uh, over most of this activity. Furthermore, we don't have any state rules yet uh, sort of governing what these activities are going to look like, nor do we have the updated federal rules. So it's hard to answer that question necessarily under the current sort of ambiguity, uh, the wild, wild west, if you will, related to the construction of both CO2 pipelines as well as CO2 storage wells. And it could be uh, an ever-changing regulatory legal landscape as things move forward. And as things get appealed, <laughs> you know, through various judiciary agencies as well, which is certain to happen because I see that you asked me potential path forward as well. Um, according to the conversations that we've had with other agencies, it's the EPA that effectively has the authority to issue this permit to inject. Uh, the process around the public process, stakeholder process, public participation, if you will, is still vague. Uh, to us as far as what role there is to play. But, um, you know, we, we, at least speaking for CAC, you know, we intend to engage when we get to the point of potential, uh, you know, permits to inject. However, it should be noted that the initial class six permit to construct is under appeal. A family farmer out in that community filed an appeal. That appeal is pending at the Environmental Appeals Board uh, at the EPA. So there is still that as well being appealed when I mentioned the judiciary uh, and things <laughs> things being appealed in an ever-changing ever landscape. At the moment, under current rules of the road, existing uh, stuff that we're aware of, it's primarily the EPA uh, that has jurisdiction here to move these things forward. But that could change uh, with new state statutes, new national rules, new national legislation relating to permitting. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion, and it's a bit of an and ambiguity as far as what the process looks like moving forward. Thank you, Kerwin. Thank you for that. Let's see. Um, we've got some questions on, and I've forgotten, is it vugginess? The Yes, very good. Yep. <laughs> How does the vugginess of the rock impact the possibility of acidic erosion, creation of fissures or fractures, and the transfer of unwanted materials or toxins? To make the simple answer on that is I don't believe the vugginess will change how the CO2 interacts with the Potosi dolomite. Uh, the dolomite is dolomite. So all we're gonna have with a vug is a hole in the dolomite. Now, if all these vugs are lined with quartz, that's a much different mineral and quartz is pretty inert to a lot of things. Uh, and uh, in all honesty, Wabash has in a section of their application a pretty extensive section there on anticipated interactions of the CO2 with, with the formation itself. But I don't believe vugginess is going to either increase or decrease the acidic reaction with the injection material and the formation itself. Now, the other portion of this, when you talk about fractures and fissures is, yeah, if there is some type of dissolution going on where the CO2 is dissolving part of the rock, it will probably just dissolve it uniformly where it contacts the rock. 
where the fissures and fractures come in is with related to the injection pressure. If the injection pressure is not closely monitored and there are specific limits to what they're allowed to inject, because if you go too high, you will exceed the compressive strength of the rock and you will crack it. That's called fracking. So that's how the fractures and fissures are created is by overpressuring with the injected material and you break the rock. So I, hopefully that answers all that. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see here. I'm not sure if we have the ability to answer this, but we do have someone joining us tonight from Jasper County. Um, and most of the county is, according to our questioner, um, high liquef liquefaction zones along with neighboring counties. Um, and it seems that some of those in authority are not concerned, but they're wondering if residents should be concerned. Dan, you want to go after <laughs> Rayleigh waves and liquefaction or? Uh, yeah. I can um, make it. I, I have come across some articles that have recently identified a number of uh, li liquefaction features, uh, mainly located along some of the, the uh, river banks, for example. Now, none of those were age dated as recent in time, but they have been within the last uh, tens of thousands of years. And the significance of that is that in order to get that type of uh, um, sand plumes that I'm talking about that have been mapped, it, it requires magnitudes of more than magnitude five earthquakes. So it shows you that this region is capable of generating some pretty significant size earthquakes at a five plus magnitude. And uh, that's an ongoing study that the USGS is looking into right now. But liquefaction, liquefaction just by itself is usually a, a process that is associated with loose, uncompacted soils, for example, in river valleys or areas, let's say, that were structurally low depressions where glaciers have covered that over with uh, unconsolidated till or, or glacial fill. Uh, in that case, the Rayleigh waves that I mentioned really stirs those up because they're unconsolidated and it can cause essentially liquefic liquefaction uh, of any features or structures at the surface. It's it's very dangerous. Once again, a 3D seismic can identify those zones. We have done that out in California specifically to identify those types of hazards. But of course you have to expand the 3D to cover the area you're investigating in that case. But uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a risk of that out there. And the question is exactly where. The only studies that I'm aware of right now that are indicating that are these more ancient uh, sand blows that have been identified along the river valleys. Thank you very much. Um, and this does seem related to, we've got a few more questions. I'm not sure if we'll get to all of them tonight, but... Um, who can create or implement the more specific, dense geophone network? And how might they become involved or be brought into a project like the one we've discussed tonight? Well, the design of those type of uh, systems is exactly what we do. Um, we've got quite a significant history of designing uh, as I said, built for purpose, customized 3D surveys, some small, some big. You can design them for the depth of the targets that you're trying to evaluate. And in this case, we know very precisely what depth we're looking for. It's the Potosi and the um, Makokota Shale zone. So those are givens. And then uh, after that, it's just a matter of uh, determining what kind of uh, mappability do we want? How closely spaced do we want our subsurface samples to be? So when we design the program, that in effect determines the spacing and the number of uh, geophones that are required to make that uh, survey work. And then we go out and we contract those from other companies 
most of the time the companies we work with are down in Texas, but they would bring up the equipment and then deploy it according to the specifications that we have uh, instructed. And then we also take the the uh, subsequent data that's recorded from that and we process it using our kind of proprietary software that helps enhance the resolution that we were talking about for the data. So we do all of that. Ooh, glad to have smart folks <laughs> involved. <laughs> Um, and I think this will be likely our last question of the night, but just know that we'll follow up via email with the couple that we have not been able to get to. But um, this last one is, is it possible for the two plumes to, quote, run into each other? And could that impact seismic activity? Theo, I think you're on mute. Thank you, I was. Had a little noise in the background here. Yes, the, uh, I'm sorry. Run that question by again, I'm all discombobulated. Welcome to the club, Steve. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, could the two plumes oh run into each other and could that impact the seismic risks? Yes, thank you, yeah. Uh, there is a possibility. We again, as I was saying, we don't know what direction these plumes are going to develop into, depending on where the porosity and permeability goes. And if there's a natural fracture network in there, we don't know. There is a possibility that two plumes could intersect each other. Um, hopefully, then again, we go back to the pressure monitoring that should show up, and injection well pressures may change. And we'll see that there is some influence on the injected material. We're, we're, we're going to see the, the pressure front from one injection well meet the pressure front from the other injection well. And in one or both of the injection wells, the injection pressure should increase when that happens. We, we should see that. Uh, if it increases too far, yes, we run into the condition of fracking the rock again which becomes a problem. Hopefully, you know, the EPA has safeguards. You can't exceed, I think it's 90% of the frac gradient of the rock, which, you know, if it's monitored, everything should be safe. But then again, uh, that all depends on how closely they're gonna monitor it. Thank you so much for that Certainly. context. and. We're at eight o'clock, so I want to extend a big thank you to Dan, Steve, and Kerwin. You've taught us so much tonight. We've learned so much, and we're so appreciative. And then, of course, another big thank you to everyone who joined us this evening and asked wonderful questions. Um, again, we'll make this recording available. We'll share webinar slides with everyone as well. And if you come up with a question after this call ends, my email address is in all of your Zoom registration emails, khammon at sidac.org. Feel free to, to fire away any other questions that come up later, but we'll respond to those we didn't get to tonight via email as soon as we can. So thanks to all. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs>